Welcome to section 24 of bacteria. This is our bacteria overview figure, and in this video, we'll be discussing Haemophilus influenzae, or H flu, which you can see right here. This scene will take place inside of an office, as you can see by the desks and the prominent sign that says the office. Office sounds like Haemophilus, so it will be our symbol for Haemophilus influenzae. Notice that we've made this office look extra hideous with the very prominent pink walls. This is to remind you that H flu is a gram-negative organism. This is a gram stain of H flu. Notice that the organism is red or pink appearing, and in some areas, it appears circular or caucus shaped. And in other areas, it looks a bit more rod or bacilli shaped. This is why H flu is considered a gram negative coccobacillus. Okay, let's return to the image and introduce a couple characters. Notice that we've shown a girl behind the desk near the top of the image. Her name is Pamelin, and she's the receptionist in this office space. The guy towards the front of the image is named James and he secretly has a crush on Pamelin. If you look closely on Pamelin's desk, you can see that we've shown several things which are kind of hard to see, so let's zoom up. First, notice that we've shown her cutting some paper with a pair of scissors. Just like in some of our other videos, the scissors are here to help you remember that one of the virulence factors of H flu is an IgA protease. Also notice that we've shown a jar of chocolate, which is here to help you remember that H flu grows on chocolate agar. We covered this in more detail in section 20, which is our Neisseria overview video, but recall that this is an image of chocolate agar. As you can see, it has a distinct brown appearance and looks kind of like chocolate. Chocolate agar is simply heated blood agar, which contains lysed red blood cells. The red blood cells are an important part of the agar because compounds called factor 5 and factor 10 are normally inside of the red blood cells. Therefore, these compounds are only available to the organisms when the medium is heated and the red blood cells are lysed. So remember, H flu can grow on chocolate agar because red blood cells are lysed, which supply the agar with factor 5 and factor 10. Alternatively, H flu can be grown on traditional blood agar next to hemolytic organisms such as Staph aureus because these organisms lyse the red blood cells which provides factors 5 and 10. This is an image of Staph aureus growing on blood agar. The large yellow appearing blobs, for example right here and right here, are colonies of Staph aureus. If you look closely, you can also see little satellite colonies surrounding Staph aureus right here. And these colonies are Haemophilus influenzae. So again, H flu can be grown on blood agar next to hemolyzing organisms because the hemolyzing organisms lyse the red blood cells, which can then supply H flu with factors 5 and 10. Okay, now let's return to the image to help you memorize these details. First, notice that we've shown a staff leaning up against the wall behind Pamelin. This is a reference to our Staph aureus video and is to help you remember that H flu can be grown near Staph aureus on blood agar. Next, notice that we've included a starfish on Pamelin's desk. The starfish has five points, which should help you remember that factor five is necessary for the growth of H flu. Factor five is also known as nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD. So starfish with five points for factor five. Finally, notice that we've added a sign on our desk that says 10 rules of the office. Some people in this office space are pretty OCD, so they like to hang up signs about specific rules and regulations. The 10 rules sign is here to help you remember that factor 10 is also required for the growth of H flu. Factor 10 is also known as hematin, so 10 rules sign for factor 10. Okay, let's introduce the OCD person who put this sign up. If we zoom back out, you can see that we've also shown this character named Dwayne that seems pretty upset. He's mad because James put his stapler in some jello, even though Dwayne specifically put a sign up on his desk that says, please respect property. Pretty funny prank if you ask me. Anyway, the please respect property sign should help you remember polyribosylribatyl phosphate or PRP, because the first letters of each word in the phrase, please respect property, makes the abbreviation PRP. Additionally, the stapler is completely surrounded by jello, just like a capsule completely surrounds a bacterium. So think of the jello as a symbol for a capsule. So putting all of this together should help you remember that encapsulated strains of H flu have a polyribosylribatyl phosphate polysaccharide capsule. Okay, before we go any further, let's take a step back to discuss how Haemophilus influenzae is classified, because this can be a bit tricky to grasp. H flu is classified into two categories based upon whether or not the organism produces a capsule, so the presence or absence of a capsule. If the organism does produce a capsule, then it's further classified based upon the antigens within the capsule, and these are called typable strains. So typable strains produce a capsule. If the organism does not produce a capsule, then it's referred to as a non-typable strain. So non-typable strains do not produce a capsule. Finally, it's important to know that typable strains are more invasive. 
This should make sense to you if you recall that a polysaccharide capsule helps the organism resist phagocytosis. So if the organism cannot be as easily destroyed by the immune system, then it's more likely to infiltrate vital organs and cause more harm. On the other hand, non-typable strains do not produce a capsule, so they're less likely to evade the immune system and are therefore less invasive. Okay, with this in mind, let's return to the image to help you memorize these details. In addition to the please respect property sign, notice that Duane has also neatly placed a strip of tape that divides James' side of the office from Duane's side of the office. As you can tell, he's pretty OCD about his stuff. The tape separating the two sides of the image is here to help you compartmentalize the typable and non-typable strains of H-flu. As we just discussed, typable strains produce a capsule, which is represented in this image by the jello. Therefore, all of the characters and information to the left of the tape on the same side as the jello will represent information about the typable strains. Likewise, everything to the right of the tape where there is no jello will represent information about the non-typable strains. Finally, notice that the tape can no longer be seen right as it goes up next to Pamela's desk right here. So all of the information towards the top of the image that we have already covered is true of both typable and non-typable strains of H-flu. Okay, notice that Dwayne is pretty pissed off because he's reaching in his drawer for some weapons. He's probably considering retaliating after the stunt that James just pulled off. If you look closely, you can see that Dwayne has a syringe in his drawer. Just like in our other images, the syringe is in this image to help you remember that there is a vaccine for H-flu. More specifically, there is a vaccine for a typable strain of H-flu, which is known as H-flu type B, or HIB. The vaccine contains the type B capsular polysaccharide, or PRP capsule, and is conjugated to a protein. This composition of the vaccine induces T-cell-dependent memory, which ultimately causes the host to produce antibodies against the PRP capsule. Therefore, the vaccine is only effective against strains of H-flu that produce a capsule. In other words, there is only a vaccine available for the typable strains of H-flu. Fortunately, the typable strains of H-flu are much more dangerous than the non-typable strains of H-flu. So the vaccine is extremely helpful in preventing serious infections. So let's talk about some of the diseases caused by the type B strain of H-flu. First, it causes epiglottitis. Let's pull up a picture of this in case you're unfamiliar with this disease. This is an image of the epiglottis. Notice that it's a cartilaginous structure just behind the tongue right here. It's depressed when you swallow and covers up the top part of the trachea to prevent food from being aspirated. If it becomes inflamed, it can obstruct the airway, resulting in asphyxiation, so it's a medical emergency. To help you remember that H-flu causes epiglottitis, we've shown Duane opening his mouth widely and yelling, Michael! You'll also notice that we've shown an x-ray of epiglottitis on Duane's computer screen. Because this stuff is to the left of the tape, we can assume that we're dealing with the typable strain of H-flu, known as Haemophilus influenzae serotype B, or HIB. So HIB causes epiglottitis. The computer screen looks like the thumb sign, so it's here to help you remember that a thumb sign may be seen on a lateral neck x-ray. This is an image of a lateral x-ray of the neck showing the thumb sign. If you look closely, you can see some resemblance of a thumb. Sometimes you may also see a cherry red epiglottis, which you can see well in this image. This is an endoscopic image of the epiglottis. You can see the cherry red epiglottis right here. Okay, with this in mind, let's return to the image. Remember how Dwayne yelled for his boss Michael? Well, to Dwayne's dismay, Michael seems to think that James's prank is pretty hilarious as you can probably tell by the way Michael is laughing and pointing while kneeling on the ground. If you look closely at Michael's knees, you can see that they're very red appearing. The fact that he's on his knees and that they're red should help you remember septic arthritis. So Hib causes septic arthritis. Okay, now let's talk about this weird old creepy guy named Credence. He's kind of a shady dude, so it makes sense that he's standing in the corner with his hood on. We've been using hats in our other images as a symbol for meningitis. So Credence's hood in this image should help you remember that Hib causes meningitis. Also notice that Credence is holding a sickle. We've used this in other images to represent sickle cell disease and asplenia. So it's in this image to help you remember that asplenic patients are at an increased risk of developing Hib infections. Remember, the spleen facilitates the removal of encapsulated organisms. So if a patient is asplenic, then encapsulated organisms are more likely to cause disease. So Credence holding up a sickle for asplenia increases the risk of Hib infections. Okay, let's return to Duane's drawer of weapons to see how he plans to retaliate. If you look closely, you can see that there is a trident next to the syringe. Just like in our other videos, the trident is here to help you remember that an effective treatment for Hib is ceftriaxone. So ceftriaxone can be used to treat meningitis, septic arthritis, and epiglottitis. 
In addition to ceftriaxone treatment for meningitis, rifampin should also be given as prophylaxis for close contacts who've been exposed to the individual with meningitis. To help you remember this, we've shown Credence wearing a hoodie with a rifle that has a bayonet. We use this symbol in our Neisseria meningitidis video, but recall that rifle sounds like rifampin, and the bayonet should make you think of close combat or close contacts. So rifle with bayonet for rifampin prophylaxis for close contacts. Okay, now that we've covered the typable strains of H flu, let's discuss the non typable strains. So, again, everything to the right side of the tape will represent this. To make this extra memorable, we've shown James's keyboard totally fried with smoke rising above it. In other words, James can no longer type because his keyboard is broken. So, you could say that the keyboard is non typable. I guess in the end, Dwayne got some form of retribution by destroying James's keyboard. Anyway, the broken keyboard should help you remember that everything on the right side of the image is regarding the non-typable strains of H flu. Because there is no jello on this side of the tape, we can deduce that these strains are not encapsulated. Before we go any further, also notice that smoke is rising from the keyboard as it breaks. We've used clouds of mist or fog in our other images to represent aerosolized transmission, but in this image, it seemed more memorable to show smoke rising from the keyboard. So the smoke rising from the keyboard is here to help you remember that H flu exhibits aerosolized transmission. You can see that the smoke is crossing over the tape, so this should help you remember that both typable and non-typable strains exhibit aerosolized transmission. Okay, with this in mind, let's discuss diseases caused by the non-typable strains of H flu. First, notice that there are a bunch of signs on the wall behind James. One of the signs says conference room, and the other says Michael's office. Signs sounds like sinusitis, so all of these signs are here to help you remember that H flu causes sinusitis. More specifically, non-typable strains of H flu cause sinusitis because this is on the right side of the image. Okay, now let's zoom up on James so we can see a few more important details. First, notice that James is wearing headphones. Just like in our other videos, this is here to help you remember that H flu causes acute otitis media. More specifically, non-typable strains of H flu cause acute otitis media. This is an otoscopic image of otitis media. Notice that the tympanic membrane is bulging out towards the viewer and appears red. This is a classic physical exam finding of otitis media. Second, notice that James's eyes are super red, probably because he's been playing Call of Duty on his computer screen for the past 12 hours straight. Anyway, his red eyes are here to help you remember that non-typable strains of H flu cause conjunctivitis. Finally, as I just mentioned, James has been playing a lot of the video game Call of Duty, as you can see on his computer screen. If you look closely at the two characters on his screen, you can see that one is holding up an ammo belt, which is our symbol for amoxicillin, and the other is holding up a cleaver, which is our symbol for clavulanate. This is here to help you remember that non-typable strains of H flu can be treated with amoxicillin and clavulanate. Okay, now that we've covered the image, let's review with a question. Our researcher is studying an organism that demonstrates poor growth on 5% sheep blood agar. However, the same organism grows well when incubated next to colonies of Staphylococcus aureus. The organism described is known to cause invasive disease through the use of what virulence factor? A. M protein, B. Polyribosylribatyl phosphate, C. Erythrogenic exotoxin A, or D. Pyrrolodonyl aralaminidase. Hopefully, from the question stem, you notice that the organism being described is Haemophilus influenzae. We can deduce this because it demonstrates poor growth on 5% sheep blood agar, but grows well when grown next to colonies of Staph aureus. Recall that Staph aureus is beta hemolytic, so it lyses red blood cells and provides nearby colonies of H flu with NAD or factor 5 and hematin or factor 10. So, with this in mind, the correct answer is B, polyribosylribatyl phosphate. I showed this image earlier, but recall that it's an image of Staph aureus growing on blood agar. The large yellow appearing blobs, right here, for example, are colonies of Staph aureus, and the small satellite colonies surrounding Staph aureus, for example, right here, here, and right here, are colonies of H flu. So as the red blood cells are hemolyzed, factors 5 and 10 spread out in the adjacent region, which allows Haemophilus influenzae to grow. From the image, recall that the Staph, back here, should help you remember that H flu can grow alongside colonies of Staph aureus on blood agar. Also, the please respect property sign alongside the jello right here should help you remember that Haemophilus influenzae has a polysaccharide capsule made up of polymers of polyribosylribatyl phosphate. If we return to the question, we can see that A is wrong because M protein is a virulence factor associated with strep pyogenines. Recall that strep pyogenines is beta hemolytic, so it would grow well on blood agar. So A is incorrect. 
C is also related to strep pyogenes. Recall that this is a toxin that causes an overwhelming release of cytokines, which results in shock. So C is incorrect. Finally, D is incorrect because this is an enzyme which is also known as PYR and is associated with strep pyogenes and enterococcus. PYR positivity or negativity can be helpful in identifying the organism, but this is not a virulence factor, so D is incorrect. So again, the correct answer is B, polyribosylribotyl phosphate. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know about Haemophilus influenzae.